Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Willie Badger podcast. Um, it's a bit of a milestones week this week, episode 10 of this, and also, a couple of days ago, it was my three-year business birthday. So, um, I may only have been on YouTube for, what, six months or so, but it is, in fact, three years since I published my first pattern. So, um, that's something. Um, to mark that, I thought I'd come on and do something a little bit different today, uh, rather than the, my sort of like, this is what I'm working on, this is all the things I should be working on kind of blog. Um, I thought I'd do a podcast about how I got to this point. Um, and also, to make it a little bit less self-indulgent, let me tell you my story. Um, a few tips on if you want to get into network design yourself, how you can make that happen. Um, I will start off just quickly though, I'm going to be knitting as I talk on this, uh, having just said I'm not going to show you what I'm working on. Here's what I'm working on! Um, it is, as you can see, a raglan sweater. Uh, it is called Chuck, because it is chuck Um We can see along there, there's a little bit of a line where I have put in bust darts to make it sit better. Um, it's not got a bust adjustment for the width in it, because it's designed to have a decent chunk of these anyway. Um, and if you have followed me before, been on my Knits That Fit Your Tits workshop, anything like that, um, you will know that I am all about choosing your size based on your upper chest measurement rather than your full bust, because you can probably see here, a bit of difference. Um, anyway, I'm hoping to have a test call out for this soon, so if you would like the chance to test knit this, it is a four ply held with strands of mohair in alternating colours and with this sort of slip stitch detail. So really great for like playing with depth of colour. Um, yes, get on my mailing list because that is where test knit calls go first. I have got a Discord server now um, where, you know, we can chat knitting, shockingly, um, and anything else that takes your fancy. So um, I will put the link in the description. It's, uh, yeah, just come join chat knitting, ask for help with anything knitting. It doesn't have to be one of my patterns. If you want to talk about one of my patterns, knock yourself out. Um, I will probably at some point start chatting about completely irrelevant stuff on there too, but it's just, um, I really enjoyed the community that was coming from test nets on Discord and sort of all the chat that was happening there. So I thought I would create one that sort of opens it up a bit more widely to those who don't want to or maybe can't participate in test nets. Come join. Anyway, shall I get my cup of tea and shall we get started on the story? So, knitwear design and knitting teaching. Not necessarily the most obvious career move for me. Um, I started off uh, my sort of adult life as an English student. I went to the University of Birmingham, I studied English. I then uh, faffed about for a year, took my gap yard, darling. Um, I went around South America a bit, and then I went to do a Master's in American Literature at the University of Sussex. And um, whilst I was there, I applied for a graduate scheme. And to be honest, I applied and I was not expecting for a single moment that I would get accepted. Um, I did not have a business type background at all. You know, I had uh, worked in independent bookstores top-notch job by the way. Um, I had done a bit of like admin temp work in university holidays. My uh, degrees qualified me for roughly nothing um, but somehow they accepted me um, and if I tell you that this was 2008 that might give you a clue as to why I felt compelled to accept the job. Uh, because the credit crunch was starting to happen. Now you may be saying, what on earth does this have to do with knitting? And I will tell you what it has to do with knitting. So I had initially been taught to knit as a kid by my babysitter. Um, her name was Maureen. She looked exactly as you would imagine a Maureen to look. Um, and she had the misfortune of regular babysitting on a Thursday night for us. Um, Thursday night in the early 90s was top of the pops night. So Maureen got treated to an awful lot of dance routines. Um, I specifically remember spinning around in my crop top and cycling shorts to take that's Could It Be Magic to show her how great a dancer I was. Uh, spoiler alert, not a great dancer. Sorry, there was the doorbell. It was um, my son's passport, black Brexit. Anyway, 
Um, yes, Maureen, I think, taught me to knit largely to shut me up and save herself from these dance routines. Um, and I knitted a bit as a kid and then I didn't really do it again for like 20 years. Which, if you are vaguely good at maths, uh, you will realise takes us to the sort of early 2010s when I was working at my corporate grad scheme -y type job. Officially no longer a graduate, um, but still same company. And I found myself, towards the end of 2011, I was off sick from work with anxiety and depression. And I was sitting in our very little flat in Clapham Junction in London all day, sort of going to therapy appointments, going to the doctors, sitting on the kitchen floor, watching the washing machine. Um, and someone, and I think it might have been my therapist said to me that maybe a bit of like therapeutic crafting would help and I went oh yeah I know how to knit um I've sort of done it in bits and pieces since the good old days of Maureen but um not seriously so I went to John Lewis in Kingston and I bought a Rowan book and some Rowan wool because that's what was sort of available. I became kind of addicted. I did a lot of knitting, a lot of knitting. If you wish to see what kind of knitting I did about that time you may wish to watch my uh rating my old knitting projects podcast. It's uh there's some interesting stuff there. I was uh I think it's safe to say I was over ambitious basically but what I liked about knitting was that it was just it was sticks and string you had sticks and string and you suddenly made something out of them with your own two hands and it was magic and at the end of the day you could sit there and be like well I have at least made that today and when my brain was very against me and telling me I was worthless and useless and all of that stuff it was nice to be able to have a bit of tangible evidence that I could hold up and go no I made this I can do at least one thing in this world so yeah, that was how the knitting came back. But that's not telling you how the knitting became a job. And the honest answer to that is uh, the knitting kind of became a job a little bit by accident originally. Um, so I left the corporate world in sort of the summer, autumn time of 2015. Um, I had changed jobs by this point. I'd, I was in communications. Um, and yeah, it was... I'd kind of reached that point in my career, I was about to turn 30, where it was, I need to decide if I want to stick this out and try and like really make a go of it and try and rise through the ranks and have this be like my life and what I do, or if I actually don't really want to do this at all and maybe I want to do something else. And um, after what I think can only really be described as a breakdown and a lot of therapy and consideration later, I kind of went, well, this wasn't even particularly what I wanted to do when I started it. I did the terrifying thing and I left without another job to go to. Um, I, my immediate plan was to do a bit of freelance writing, having worked in communications, you know, writing was a thing that was a fairly obvious sideways move. Um, and I sort of messed around for a bit with writing online features. Um, I decided I wanted to write a novel. Fun fact, I had in fact got a finished first draft of a novel stored somewhere on the cloud, which I don't think anyone will ever read, because uh, once I had finished it, I realised that I only wanted to write a novel to prove to myself that I could. I don't have any interest in anyone ever reading it or it getting published or anything like that. I just wanted to know I could do it. So yes, there was the writing. Then I got pregnant and I am really bad at being pregnant. Really bad. I just throw up relentlessly. Um, so I couldn't really work in that way anymore. I couldn't look at computer screens, I couldn't really do anything. Um, and then I had a baby and then, you know, you have all these grand plans of like, oh, whilst, whilst I'm on maternity leave, I'll like do this, that and the other. No, whilst you're on maternity leave, you will hold a baby that will not sleep unless it is on you. Let's be honest here. Um, I then decided to start a little Etsy shop. I would love to know what percentage of businesses start life as a little Etsy shop. I think in the creative space, it's probably most of them. Um, but my Etsy shop was selling finished knits. Um, so little baby cardigans and hats and things like that. And I did like one market and I made maybe sort of 
30, 40 sales on Etsy, but God, it was a slog. It was a slog. Um, and if you are any kind of knitter who has ever considered selling finished products, you will know that it is almost impossible to charge fairly for your um, work. And by fairly, I mean to charge what it is actually worth in terms of your time, as opposed to what people are willing to pay for it. Because people tend to benchmark against what they get in the shops, which is fair enough, but machine knitting and hand knitting, like mass produced stuff and like handmade stuff, mate, not the same. Cannot, I, you know, I think, I'm not sure I even made enough in that first year to have to file a tax return. So in England, you have to file a tax return if you take over a thousand pounds in revenue from a sort of small business second income. I'm not sure I even hit that. Um, so it became pretty apparent that that was not going to be a sustainable job for me. So I don't think I really need to tell anyone what was going on in the spring of 2020. I think we all remember. I think we're all still a little bit scarred by it. Um, but yes, yeah, spring of 2020, I was here. I had a three-year-old. I had a seven-month-old when the first lockdowns came in. And it is uh, fair and accurate to say that knitting kept me sane during those first few months of lockdown and everything. I was knitting a lot and I had sort of run out of patterns to knit and also I couldn't quite make my brain because I had quite bad postnatal depression as well um I couldn't make my brain work enough to be able to make any decisions on patterns I could not even clicking the filters on the advanced search on Ravelry was just too much for me because I was just like I just if you have ever had depression or anxiety, you will know that you do get just complete brain. It freezes up and the most simple decision becomes completely overwhelming and you just can't do it. And then you start beating yourself up about the fact you can't make the decision and start spiraling and it can get very dark very fast. Um, so for about the first time in my life, I had been religiously a follower of patterns up to this point. I kind of just went rogue. And I started making things up myself. Specifically, I made up a shawl for a friend of mine who her, she was, is a teacher um, and had been working her ass off. Um, had two small kids of her own and had been a enormous support to me through, you know, all of the horror <laughs> of that sort of time. Um, and I decided I was going to knit her a shawl. So I sort of looked at a stitch dictionary and sent her some pictures of some nice uh, motifs that I thought might go together and got her to pick which one she wanted and got her to tell me what colour she wanted it to be and then I knitted it and then uh, she and a few other friends said oh do you know what maybe you should publish a pattern for that and I thought yeah all right I may as well I mean it was the big craft boom of 2020 so I did it um, I hired a tech editor who had been recommended to me when I had been sort of dabbling in the idea of patterns before I had my second child. And um, I got it test knitted and I published it and I think maybe three people bought it. But it gave me more of a sense of purpose and I felt like, you know, it was such a time when everything was out of control in every possible way and it felt like this tiny little pocket I could control and also it was just really fun. So yes that shawl that was the beginning of it um that I published on June 26 2020 and I think uh over the next sort of six seven months or so I published various other accessories there were some socks hat cowl um and then I decided to go for the big boy garments and it was with this slip stitch motif that has become the like Jimmy Jab signature thing I had first put it on a hat which is called the Bing Pot Beanie you will note there is a theme in these names if you're a Brooklyn Nine-Nine fan um and my eldest really liked it he liked his colorry hat and he asked me if I could make it into a jumper and I thought, hey, you know what, I'll give that a try. But this is the point where I am going to switch tack slightly and stop being like old lady storyteller and start giving you 
a few of my hints and tips because it's all very well to sit here and say, oh, I did this and then I had a nervous breakdown and then there was a global pandemic and then I became a net designer, woohoo! Um, I recognise that's quite a unique set of circumstances and I hope it's not one that any of you will find yourselves in. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about the how and I am going to start with my one biggest tip. So I said earlier that I dabbled with writing for a while. I went to a few writing courses and the one thing that they all said was if you want to be a good writer, you have to read. You have to basically study your craft. Knitting's the same. If you want to be a knit designer, you got to knit. You got to knit everything. You've got to knit the different constructions. You've got to knit the different designers. You've got to knit the different sort of things. Um, and more than that, what I would do, and I realised I had been doing for, for the last couple of years before I really got into actually designing myself, was as I was knitting a pattern, I'd be sort of thinking to myself, oh, so why is that instruction saying to do that there? What is that doing? What is that creating in the fabric? I know I also said earlier that my degrees have me qualified for absolutely nothing, but it is a little bit weirdly like textual analysis. From an English degree um, because everything in the pattern has been put there for a reason um, and if you knit it with the sort of mindset of oh what is that reason what is that doing it helps if you want to design you know shawls knit shawls if you want to design jumpers knit jumpers like there is no better learning than the practical thing um, I'm not saying copy the instructions at all. I, in fact, I am saying absolutely do not copy the instructions. But there are some things that are sort of common across all design structures. Um, circular yokes all work from the basis of you start with this number of stitches and you end up with this number of stitches. Um, and working different designs will show you the different ways you can get there. And you can start working out what you want to do with yours. Tip two, when it comes to what to design. I don't know. I haven't actually spoken to that many other designers about this, but... I know personally what I design is what I want to wear. Um, so I don't tend to sit there and go, oh, what's there a trend for at the moment? I tend to sit there and go, what do I want in my wardrobe? Chances are, if you want it in your wardrobe, someone else will want it in theirs too. So yeah, I've never been that concerned about like, oh, what are the massive trends right now? What's um, what's on Ravelry's Hot right now? What are the big hashtags on Instagram? Um, I think partly some of that is just my personality. I was a teenage goth. Um, I rejected the ordinary. I listened to angry music um, at university. Every boy I ever met at every party ever told me that I had to watch two things. I had to watch The West Wing and I had to watch Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. And I refused to watch either of those until I was like well into my 30s. And then I was like, damn it, those, those stupid boys at those stupid parties were correct. Anyway, I am not seeking out to become super fashionable, super trendy. I think also with knitwear, let's be honest, you take so bloody long to make it that you want something you can wear year after year. So yes, design what you would like. It's kind of build it and they will come, ish. Tip three, do not panic too much about originality. Um, I said just before that, you know, all sort of circular yokes follow the same basic thing. There's also a kind of thing, there are only so many ways you can knit a jumper. Um, and certainly if you look around for like, say basic plain raglan patterns, there are loads of them out there. Um, but they do all offer something slightly different. And what you are bringing to the table as a designer is not just the sort of finished item you're making, but it's also the how you're making it, the how you get there, which um, is in how the pattern is written a lot. One of the very biggest learning curves for me when I switched from being a consumer of knitting patterns to a writer of knitting patterns is that actually there are umpteen different skills involved. Um, there's the being able to come up with the knitting pattern. Um, so being able to come up with the garment and being able to come up with something that will be repeatable across all sizes um, that will look sort of similar and all of that. And then there's the actual writing of the pattern. Um, and I had assumed that because I could make a pattern, like make a garment that I was happy with, I would be able to write a pattern that was great straight away. Not the case. Um, you, it takes 
practice and probably a lot of back and forths with the tech editor and all of that to come up with something that makes sense to other people. Um, and so what you are bringing is not just the jumper you're making, but it's the instructions of how you're making it. It's how you are writing your pattern, um, what resources you are including, what sort of tips and techniques you're saying, even just sort of down to how you word it. Um, to be honest, that's the real difference between a good pattern and a mediocre pattern. Um, you can have a pattern that, like, you know, a top that looks amazing and is completely original and all of that, but if the pattern makes no sense, no. Obviously there are caveats to this, like don't straight up copy other people. Don't go, oh, that's really nice, I'm gonna just rip that off. Um, but don't freak out too much if you want to do a relatively basic garment um, that there are already loads out there because it will be your garment. So I mentioned the tech editing and uh, this brings us to tip, is it five? I've lost count, this is bad, I should know. But whatever tip number it is, is get a tech editor. My God, they are invaluable. They will check your maths, they will check that it all makes sense, they will, you know, proofread, do all sorts. I could not function as a knitwear designer without a tech editor. Um, it can seem a bit when you're first starting out and like maybe it's, maybe you should skip it because you know, it's spending money. And when it's your first pattern, it might be money that you're very loath to spend, but it is so worth it. Um, depending on the editor, they can sort of charge between 25, 35 pounds an hour. It's kind of standard rate over here. Um, so worth it and yes you make it maybe we'll sit there and go oh god but that's adding to my pattern costs and how is that gonna how am I gonna recoup that it's making my break even point like just just kick those thoughts away they are not helpful to you one of things about knitting patterns is once they are done and they are online and there for people to buy they remain there I still get people now buying patterns that I published two three years ago um, I occasionally will dig them out and talk about them. I probably should do that more, let's be honest. Um, but a tech editor is only gonna add value. I'm so sorry I just said add value. But the point is if you publish a badly written pattern with wrong numbers that doesn't actually make sense, nobody's gonna come back and buy another pattern from you. If you publish one that is like professional standard, then yeah. People are going to enjoy knitting it. People will come back. Next point, listen to the feedback. Um, so after you've had your pattern tech edited, you should do a test knit of it to see how it sort of works with real world knitters. Um, I used to get test knitters through a platform called Yarn Pond, which was really great for um, when you don't have a big following yet and you're sort of new to the design world, you can post your uh, test call on there and they have a pool of test knitters who have signed up and um, can look at all the open test calls and go oh yeah I'll do that there are also hashtags on Instagram you can use um you know all of that stuff I have now moved my tests off of yarn pond and I run them through I send out a uh sign a, like google sign up form to my mailing list and then hold the actual test knits on discord I mean, the whole point of getting the test knit done is to see how knitters find the pattern. So you want to listen to what they're saying to you. Um, if they're saying to you, actually, this bit doesn't much make sense, you want to rewrite that bit. Um, you know, it does, yes, it gets you photos of your pattern knitted by different knitters and different yarns on different people, all of that stuff. But the real golden bit there is you get the feedback, um, which is why you want to test knit and tech edit. I know it can seem like extra faff, I know it can be annoying that you're like, I've got this pattern, I'm so excited, I want to get it out in the world. Like, I have got, I'm just finishing off my second sample here, the Tallulah camisole coming out soon, which currently only has one front strap. Um, this is currently in test knitting. I finished writing this pattern in like early May. It will be coming out, it's probably got another three weeks to go. It's slow. Everything in knitting is slow. It's all slow, it's fine. Final tip, just bloody back yourself. Like, I mean, like I said, it's sticks and string. 
it sticks in string. Worst case scenario, you publish the pattern, no one buys it. You go, I tried, I'll move on. Um, best case scenario, you have a new job. Um, I spent many years before I actually started designing, sort of looking at patterns and being like, oh my God, this is amazing. I would absolutely love to do this and design patterns, but I never really thought I could until I tried. And um, there is very little that is quite as joyous as seeing somebody else knit one of your patterns and enjoy the experience of knitting it and enjoy wearing the finished thing. Like it still does genuinely blow my mind a little bit that, you know, you know, take this. This was an idea I had in my brain, the summer jimmy jab, and it is now out of my brain and it is in other people's like houses if they've printed it off or Ravelry libraries or their emails and they are knitting it and they are wearing it. And I, I do genuinely find that kind of bonkers in a brilliant way. I mean, I just really love knitting, really. Can you tell? I just love knitting. So yes, that is my sort of story. Those are my tips. Um, if you are watching this, like as it's just gone live, there is um, a like celebration birthday sale going on. Uh, the code three bloody years, all in lowercase, all one word, gets 25% off all my patterns on Payhip. Uh, they're automatically discounted on Ravelry. Um, if you are not watching this before the 2nd of July, uh, 2023, um, then get on my mailing list because that's where I tell people about sales as they're going on. Um, and yes, if you have any questions, comments, any of that malarkey, let me know below. Um, I should also tell you to like and subscribe, shouldn't I? So yes, like, subscribe, all of that. Um, I am going to go and do some more knitting now, you know, just for a change. So thank you for joining me.